Time to get started. I want to continue with Marx's um, essay on Bruno Bauer's on the Jewish question, which we hadn't finished on Wednesday. As a reminder, Bruno Bauer is a left Hegelian. He's a liberal who wants a constitutional German state. And he addresses the Jewish question because Jews are asking in the 1840s for full rights, equal rights in the Prussian monarchy. And Bauer says, hold on, because we Germans don't really have rights as citizens. It is an incomplete state, a false state with a monarch on top, no constitution, no representation, no individual rights. So you're asking to be affirmed in your Jewishness by the state to the same extent that Germans are defined as Christian and the state tells us that it is a Christian state. But we know that this is not the true state. The true state is the one like they have in America or they had in the French Revolution where everybody is equal as a citizen because at that point our nature as members of the species who are, in fact, free, equal, rational, and so forth, finds reflection in the form of the state. But in order for that to work, we have to shed our religious prejudices, and the state has to free itself from religion. Is that the same for Jews and Gentiles? And this is where it becomes clear that Bauer actually has some specific problem with the inclusion of Jews in any kind of state. So if there is anti-Semitism to discuss in the context of this essay, it is Bauer's. And Marx, of course, attacks the foundations of Bauer's thinking, shows that there is a contradiction here where he thinks that Jews are especially unfit to be included in the political community as equals because he considers Judaism Bauer considers Judaism to be a religion that tells its adherents that they are special, that they ought to and were designed by God to be separate from everybody else. All religions do that, of course, which is why these Enlightenment-centered um, liberals want to free government from, because that's one of the main things that separates people from each other. Um, and prevents them from seeing themselves as in their true nature as species beings. But Jews apparently, according to Bauer, are especially bad in that respect. So specifically, when you ask, when Marx asks, in reading Bauer, evidently you enjoy the rights of man under the constitutions that grant them, whether it's the Bill of Rights in the United States, whether it's the French um, Declaration of the Rights of Man. Nowhere does it say that you have to stop believing in Christ or God in order to enjoy these rights of man. How about how does that work for Judaism? Do you have to renounce it? And Bauer apparently says, yes, you do, because Judaism is a religion that tells you to separate yourself from the rest of the world. And it inherently makes you hostile to the rest of the community. So this is an argument against Bauer's anti-Semitism, but also it shows that there is some misunderstanding when it comes to the relation between religion and the state in general, as Marx wants to point out. Because if you look at these, the perfect state, the state that is free and real, and that has emancipated itself from religion, where everybody is equally a citizen, regardless of their religion and so forth. And nobody is privileged in terms of having um, access to specific jobs, to land ownership, to what business they can found and stuff. If you look at these, um, the freedom of every man to practice the religion of which he is an adherent is part of the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, 1791, Article 10. Um, and then Marx cites two American constitutions, Pennsylvania, 
Article 9, paragraph 3, all men have received from nature the imprescriptible right to worship the Almighty according to the dictates of their conscience. Constitution of New Hampshire, Article 5, Articles 5 and 6, among these natural rights, some are by nature inalienable since nothing can replace them. The rights of conscience are among them, which includes, again, the right to decide how and if to worship a god, any god. So, in other words, what's the point of these free constitutions? Um, to be left to your own devices when it comes individually to decide whether you want to worship any god and how. So, that alone to say certain religions aren't eligible for this. Say a Muslim can never be a full American. Or to take a 19th century example, a Catholic, because they're always going to be um, taking orders from Rome. That contradicts the basic principle. If you think that your your community is based on, on membership that presupposes a religion, you're not really saying that everybody is fully free to pick their own religion. Um, but that is not just a matter of Bauer being anti-Semitic or discriminatory, but rather um, it is a contradiction built into the makeup of this liberal state. What is the problem with religion? What is the problem with Judaism or Christianity? It might require people to do things that contradict the demands of the state which are at all times rational and, and good because they reflect the nature of man as a species being. And ideally, they're legitimized through a democratic process, through at least a constitutionally legitimate process. Um, what's wrong with that process? Or what's wrong with the relationship between the state and the people? Here Marx says, quote, the perfect political state is, by its nature, man's species life. Fair enough. Um, the species is composed of three equals, and together they can figure out what they want to do to make life better for everybody in the future. So the perfect political state, like the United States, like revolutionary France, New Hampshire, the free or die, or Pennsylvania, those are perfect political states, and they reflect, they embody man's species life. But, ends the quote, as opposed to his material life. So in his material life, man is anything but free or equal. You get to, hold on now, let me see if I can find the passage. In this new liberal order, man was not freed from religion. He received religious freedom. He was not freed from property. He received freedom to own property. He was not freed from the egoism of business. He received freedom to engage in business. So if you want that people are freed from religion, freed from property, um, freed from egoism, in other words, from all the things that make them separate themselves from humanity and from the species, that make them work for their own goals as opposed to for the common good, um, then maybe this perfect political state is just a semblance. It may not actually be the real deal because why? Well, the very essence of it is to guarantee people the right to do these things, the right to own property, the right to be religious, the right to have your opinion as opposed to everybody else's and stick to it in spite of rational arguments to the contrary. It lets people separate themselves from the community. That's the point of the state. So material life, the real world, so to speak, is where people are competitors. The individuals that do their own thing without reference to anybody else, um, they're not communal, they're particularistic. And to the extent that they move beyond the individual and the family unit, the household as an economic unit, um, they group themselves with others who also form a group, form a community 
to not be part of the whole. So a separate religious entity, um, a craft, the chamber of commerce, whatever else. So in other words, civil society is just completely, like real material life is just completely characterized by particularism. There's nothing there that incentivizes people to act, to act with the common good or the species in mind. So the only place where the species is realized in its potential as unified in pursuing rational goals is in the abstract, in the life of the state, where, the, where people are, by definition, equal as citizens. But to the extent that they're real people, they're still bourgeois, self-interested, and all that. So that's the real contradiction. Um, does that make sense? Any questions about this idea? Fine. Um, so where do the Jews come in into this e equation? Um, Marx is spending a lot of the rest of the essay criticizing the way of thinking of the self-interested bourgeois. Um, he's doing that, however, in terms that here it's a question of interpretation. Um, employs anti-Semitic stereotypes, parodies them, cites them. Um, I would say at this stage in Marx's development, probably employs them. He thinks of Jews as self-interested, money-grabbing spirits of peddlers, um, the spirit, spirit of Schacher, like the small-time peddlers, but also it involves a certain notion that maybe the goods aren't as valuable as they're being sold for. So this is fraudulence involved, deception. Um, but crucially, he's not saying it's the Jews that are doing these kinds of things as distinct from good Christian business people. He is saying to the extent that Christians or anybody engages in business, and acts as a self-interested bourgeois, they're being Jewish. They're doing the things that you say the Jews do. Um, so if you, if you think that that's a problem, and if you associate these attitudes with Judaism, your real problem here is not with Judaism. It's with bourgeois society, with the commercial spirit, with the exploitation of labor, with trade and finance and industrial production that exploits people. And it's not about the attitude and it's not about the religion. It is not that Jews believe um, or that industrialists believe that this is the way to do things. It is that this is how it's done and it makes sense for them under the given condition to act in this fashion. That's the way that civil society is organized. Um, so unless we change that, and this goes back to the whole approach in the thesis on Feuerbach, you don't change anything by changing the thinking. It's only if you change the conditions that make it necessary for people to think about them in these sick and twisted ways that you make any significant change. Because if you change the conditions, then the thinking will follow suit. Um, but if you don't like the thinking, if you realize it doesn't make any sense, don't expect it, don't expect it to get fixed without touching the real world. So apparently there is something fundamentally wrong with the way that people act uh, with a split consciousness, conscience, whatever, consciousness, where they are disinterested citizens in relation to the state and their political existence, while at the same time being self-interested bourgeois in the economic existence. Um, and so the contradiction here, of course, between um, these two ends, the, the real world and the political reflection, um, does mean that liberal political theory and social theory and economic thought is also going to be contradictory. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't explain the world. It can't explain the world. Um, because it doesn't want to resolve this contradiction. It just wants a workable theory that is plausible enough while leaving the contradiction in place. So 99% of what is being taught in any university at any given point in time um, is, it, it can fall under this criticism. 
of being necessarily false on a fundamental level because it is trying to sort of you know shoehorn itself into this contradiction without actually addressing, let alone resolving it. Marx, on the other hand, says the point, however, is to change the world. You have inter interpreted it in different ways. That doesn't do you any good. Um, you need to actually change the social practice. So um, organize the world in some way so that people do not act selfish, that they do not treat each other as competitor, competitors, as means to an end, as enemies. In 1843, when this dispute over the Jewish question took place, Marx really didn't have much of an idea of how that might be accomplished, how you might free people from the commercial spirit. But he was at the point where he was saying, who cares about the philosophy? Who cares about the ideas? Only to the extent that you can show what's wrong with the world once you look at them and take them serious. Um, that over time, of course, the social process drives Marx's thinking along, as um, you know, he would be pleased to realize because that conforms to his way of seeing the world. So um, in the 1840s, as capitalism was advancing more and more, it was dissolving the old feudal order, especially in the, like in the countryside and in the cities, it was casting out more and more people out of dependent relations as serfs, as craftsmen who were um, obliged to stay with their master, whether they were, they were journeymen or apprentices, and more and more people lose this coercive but also cushy um, situation where they're taken care of in exchange for not having full freedom. So economic freedom, industrial takeover of previously protected industries, all of that means massive social upheaval. And while capitalism and industry grow uh, exponentially in the 1840s, significantly, like it reaches its takeoff point in that decade, economists say. Um, you get the point where, where you go from having a society that has a capitalist component or a sector that runs by capitalist principle to having a society that is capitalist and where capitalist ways of doing business determine everything that is being done. And you go from a society that has an industrial economy to a society that is based on industrial economy and where that uh, drives develop, but it doesn't drive development far enough in the 1840s. So um, industry does not absorb all the people it has made redundant in the industries it has revolutionized. Um, and that creates poverty, hunger, homelessness. You've got people who come to the cities there's nothing left for them on the farm, the traditional economy. They come to the big industrial cities and there is no work. So you get an underclass of pauper, basically made redundant, made useless. And that's a revolutionary ferment right there. And then um, in 1848, with other issues uh, converging too on this, you get a, a universal revolutionary situation. So all over Europe, revolutions are begun. And usually the unifying thought behind them is um, constitutional democracy. Right? America, revolutionary France, that's still the main uh, guiding principle. We want something like they have. So in Germany, for instance, the German parliament um, looks, like many people in there, look to America, want to establish relations with that republic, that has lasted for so long, um, consider that to be the natural ally and so forth. Um, so in this 1848 revolution, like in any revolution, the mass of the people who, who um, pulled the guns and built the barricades and hurled the bricks at royal soldiers and so forth are of course not university professors, lawyers and journalists. Those are just the people who write about the revolution and lead it. Businessmen, you know, the parliament in Frankfurt that is elected as a, an all German democratically elected parliament is dominated by this upper middle class. 
But the people who actually hold the guns and throw the bricks, that's usually the working class or small time farmers. Um, same as in the United States in 1776. Same as in France in 1789. The bourgeoisie might lead a revolution, but they can't make one themselves. They really need um, the common people to do that for them. And while, to their credit, American revolutionaries in the 1770s and 80s um, consciously built this coalition between the unwashed masses and the highly educated leadership to see through their independence from Britain and wisely waited for the backlash and counter-revolution until the late 18, uh, 1780s. By the time it gets to the 1848 revolutions, in many places, the bourgeoisie is already torn between, on the one hand, wanting to get rid of feudalism and monarchy, but on the other hand, really not having the guts to arm the workers in order to do this. Because these are the people who have already had issues with them, um, who have been striking, who have been costing them money. And you don't even know for sure if really what they want is, is the kind of freedom that you have in mind, like a constitutional order. As with, with any revolution before, however, the revolution is going to fail unless you get that coalition to work. So when the bourgeoisie, when the upper middle class in the German states um, really is put to the test, they say, actually, sorry about this, we didn't mean it. Um, let's go home. Like when the, when the king, the parliament in Frankfurt comes up with a, rev, with a, rev, with a constitution, a constitutional monarch. They don't actually want to abolish monarchy. They can't get themselves to do that. So many lawyers and theologians and university professors are saying, you know, it's like part of our culture and of our national tradition. We have to have a Kaiser. So they go to Berlin and offer this guy, William IV, who, when he came to office, said Prussia is a Christian state. Remember that set this whole thing up. Um, they offer him the crown. And by this time, while the parliament was talking, the Prussian army and its allies have been mobilized and they've worked to shoot workers, dismantle barricades, um, you know, defeat revolutionary armies. And by the time the parliament finally gets its act together and, and goes to Berlin, William says to them, um, go away, I will not wear a crown that's tainted by the dirty hands of the mob. So, um, and I need you to dissolve your parliament unless you also want a visit by the Prussian army. And so the, the um, re honorable representatives of the German upper middle class say, oh, sorry about that. Didn't mean to bother you, sir. Uh, you know, enjoy your monarchy. We'll be going home. Now. Um, a, a minority of the parliament remains in session. It has support by the revolutionary governments of Baden and Württemberg and Southwest Germany for the last battles are fought in the Black Forest, like in the foothills of the Black Forest, where the Prussian army defeats the last, you know, um, remnants of a revolutionary military. The German fleet that had been put together is uh, dismantled, that had been like a revolutionary um, navy basically with a, with a cadre of people committed to national unity and whatnot, uh, all that is scrapped. Like it was significant, it, it wasn't crushed, you know. Um, it's kind of like the, uh, the Republican Air Force in France in the 1930s. Um, so that was the end of it. But what does Marx have to do with this process? You know, in 1848, the Communist Manifesto is published. Who um, commissioned that work? Because Marx didn't just get the idea to write it uh, on a whim. Who commissioned that work? Who asked them, can you help us write this? You know? <laughs> the workers of uh, the Rhineland, who were figuring out at the time that they are in a revolution where they are sort of fighting side by side with their bosses, but they don't have the same interests. And they really need to do their own organizing if they are going to achieve anything. 
And because they didn't study political theory, not to the same extent as, you know, this prominent liberal journalist, Marx, who was working for the uh, for the revo most revolutionary newspaper at the time, they asked him if he can write something for them. So he got together with them and they talked and he drafted something and that's the Communist Manifesto, which literally is about explaining what do we want? What's the goal of our party? How do we differ from others as the Communist Party? Um, and so it turns out that the goals of these communists, of these workers who want to make revolution, is pretty much um, what Marx and others like him had been imagining all along. They want a society in which property is uh, no longer a thing for all practical purposes. The means of production, factories, railroads, etc., are owned by the community at large. People get to live their lives productively without having to look over their shoulder whether they're going to starve because they don't get paid enough. Um, inheritance is abolished. People work for their own um, welfare, but you don't get the buildup of intergenerational wealth. All those kinds of things. In other words, society is organized as one where people work together for one common goal without anybody profiteering. And that is still what we consider to be communism. Um, the party, the workers organized in it, um, was repressed. By 1851, the Prussian monarchy was fully back in power. By 1852, reaction had been established in all the German states, and everybody who had been anyone prominent in this revolutionary movement had to get out of the country or ended up in some dungeon. So Marx and Engels went to London. Um, others, Francis Liebert, and no, Justus Liebert, sorry, um, Paul Schurz, trying to think of other names you might have heard. Uh, if you studied the 19th century, if you studied the Civil War, you'll, you'll know these names. So Lincoln, the Republican Party, has an incredible variety of German exiled revolutionaries to draw who are in <clears throat> getting into all the details of like emancipation. Liebert is writing the law book, the rule book for the Union Army in the Civil War. You know about him. He's basically the father of modern um, the modern rules of warfare. And it goes back to um, the guidelines, no, the orders he wrote for what to do and not to do as a soldier if you're dealing with enemies and civilians and so forth. Um, so all that stuff then takes, takes a, a flight and is taking root in the United States, some of it in England, England, some in Belgium too. But that's how Marx ends up having to quit the active political struggle. I mean, England is still a place where there's lots of that going on there. It's still a place where the, the right to vote is, is not established. But basically, the bourgeoisie runs the place. Sure, the nobles are still around, but they have less and less actual economic power, which means that as a social class, they're dead. Um, if you've watched Gosford Park or, or um, Downton Abbey, are you watching that? No. Um, well, it's an illustration. I mean, Downton Abbey and the family that runs it is the exception to the rule. That's like the trick of keeping that estate alive. They presumably modernized their operations just in the nick of time, but everybody else around them is like in steep decline as an economic model, that whole estate, noble estate with farmers and servants doesn't work anymore. So, um, but this decline was already underway in the 19th century. Um, and there Marx observes how bourgeois society, how capitalist society ticks and wants to study that scientifically in order to figure out where you might place a lever um, to tip the whole thing over and down the, you know, down the ravine into the trash heap of history. Um, but he gets there and he's basically radicalized towards this 
but to, to what any sense of what this new type of society might look like by his actual involvement with the working class movement in the political revolution, like people who would actually want a program so that they can tell other people why they should come and join them on the barricades and possibly get themselves shot. Any questions? Anything else about the Jewish question and the Jewish aspect of that? Yeah. Uh, so as far as Marx, as far as Marx's interpretation of the uh, of Jews goes, does he believe that um, they're too associated with like bourgeois self-interest and greed? Is that like his main claim there? In 1843, I think he still has that anti-Semitic stereotype and unquestioned. You know, I think that more or less uh, he did just that pretty soon after. Like by 1848, there is no more sign of that. In capital, Jews don't play a role in the argument. Because in fact, like if you're willing to acknowledge the, the way the world really looks, and that's sort of one of the bases of the, of the whole project of Marx, um, you can't help but notice that Jews are on average poorer than the Christian condom. So clearly, whatever you thought about them being like the authors of commercial society and stuff, not the case. Yeah. What was Marx's view regarding black people? Because I had a government teacher that said he was racist against black people, but... I'm sorry, what? He was what? racist against white people? Black people. Black people. Um, that's bizarre and a smear. I mean, he, he was really conservative, so like I took everything he said with a grain of salt, but... He was conservative? Yeah, like one like, time in class, he straight up said that like Democrats are killing babies regardless of what shit. Oh, because, I mean, okay, that also is not true, um, mm -hmm. but... The claim that Marx is racist is one that I usually hear from people who are committed to a race-conscious rewriting of history along the lines of the 1619 project. Identitarian liberals and such, who will say that Marx is a, a representative of white supremacy because he is speaking from a European perspective and because he has the enlightenment framework of, philosophic, uh, of philosophy that wants universalism, that sees all people as equally members of the same species, which is a tool, like I said in my earlier lectures, they will say that it's a tool of colonial and racist domination. So it's this double bind, you know. If you say equality and humanity, you're a racist. If you say you want universal things, good stuff for all people, you're also a racist. So it's like, um, and if you criticize that approach to social theory, you're definitely a racist. Um, so this is spurious. And of course, people will um, say that about Marx. When it comes to Marxism today, when it comes to the reception of Marx, and the practice of, of Marxism and the development of it, communists like to point out that a majority of theorists and activists who considered themselves Marxists or communists were not white, were not European. Um, and that's a truth. And half the people I, um, I know on, on social media and hang out with there and, and talk to are uh, who are Marxists. Um, are not white. And some of them are straight out of countries that are not European and not North American. Um, so you can always say that apparently these people are caught in a colonial discourse where they are self-hating uh, Africans or Asians who embrace Marx because they just love their uh, the dominance of the white men, but that's stretching, yeah. So would you say that Marx believes that race is really 
not that important to history and that it's more of a social construct and that we should really focus on material conditions and yeah. that type of thing? Like, would you say that or am I misinterpreting? Marx doesn't talk much about race, but the logic of his view of religion, for instance, would suggest because race, like religion, is a major way of separating humanity into different hostile groups. So it would be one of those things where man is not living according to his potential as a species being. Um, but he has not, to the best of my knowledge, developed a theory of racism. Marxists, however, have dealt with it. He did support, enthusiastically support, the union in the Civil War with things with saying things like labor in white skin can't be free where labor in black skin is enslaved. So it wasn't irrelevant. You also have to keep in mind that African colonization, as well as Asian, doesn't really start to really take off until the 1880s. You have Orientalism, you have the slave trade um, since the 1500s. But what you don't have is territorial colonization in Africa or Asia until the 1880s when quinine becomes available to treat tropical diseases, especially malaria. So before that, there was simply no way that white Europeans could go into these places and come back out alive. So that also coincides with an acceleration of the development of quote unquote scientific racism. And at that point, of course, it is. Um, you know, Marxists, communists, etc., who are holding back against them, whereas the entire bourgeois science apparatus is um, jogging towards the right exit, wants to be wants to be first to to come up with the edgiest theory of why white people are the most superior ever. Um. I, I'm forgetting when he died, but did he ever engage with those um, scientific racial ideas? Or Not to my knowledge, no. But if you um, look at the labor movement, if you look at socialist or communist parties and their practice, um, they had a fairly consistent track record of criticizing colonialism and racism. So the German Social Democrats, for instance, who do get a lot of legitimate uh, criticism for the way they facilitated the repression of the 1919 revolution in Germany and how they collaborated with the empire in World War I. Nevertheless, before that, at least until 1906, had a long and heroic tradition of going out of their way to address the um, oppression of women, of Africans, of Poles and Danes and other minorities who organized Jews and stuff. So in the, in the early 1900s, when Germany was conducting a genocide in Namibia, the German Social Democratic Party and some liberal and Catholic allies it had explicitly scandalized it and argued against the, the races. And um, that kind of showed the battle lines there in society, like who, who believed in inequality and was actually willing, um, you know, to act on that. And, and the German army and its supporters back home were enthusiastic about showing the savages who's boss, basically. The interesting thing is that after social democrats and liberals uh, responded to that with the power that they did have, which was to withhold funds in the parliament they controlled, the Reichstag, um, reactionary, conservative propaganda started to merge the image of the worker, the red worker, and the black savage as one. It's the black and red peril combined. It's the savagery, it's the, the driven, senseless by passions. It's the same difference. So um, in that sense too, 
for those who say, well, the labor movement and Marxism always marched in lockstep with European imperialism. There is no distinction there. They didn't care. Um, and if you claim otherwise, you're a racist. You know, that's also flimsy. I don't know about the British labor movement or the French, to what extent they were also openly against the older colonial projects of those places. But I do know that when subjects of the French colonies did uh, act politically and did get themselves elected to the National Assembly, for instance, like the colonial dependencies of France still are represented in the National Assembly, of course, to this day, the island of Martinique uh, elected a communist, Aimé Césaire, who ended up writing the discourse on colonialism, which really, I think, is still read in any good class on racism. Part. Has, has anybody read that yet, Aimé Césaire? Oh, okay, you should read it. Um, It's a communist critique of the racial justifications for colonialism, the whole the whole range of it. And he writes this after World War II. So very ironically, he says, let's talk about the horrible racism of the Nazis. Let's talk about how evil and unique they were in the evil. So here is the thing that Hitler said about other races. Oh, oops, wait a minute. Nope, nope, my bad. Uh, that was a Frenchman speaking in the 1920s. Um, let's look at Hitler in the original. Oh, no, wait, that was an Englishman. Oh, here I have a guy from Belgium um, speaking about the Congo. Uh, so he's saying, what is it that your problem is with Hitler? Apparently you agree with him. Oh, um, he also did it to you. He also did it to him. So um, that's basically his, his critique of the sudden discovery of um, anti-racism among the uh, in, in, imperial elites. So the question of Marx the racist, Marx the white supremacist, Marx the European Enlightenment rationalist pig um, resolves itself into that initial question of epistemology. Do you think with post-structuralism that it's all the same thing and that enlightenment is an exercise in oppression? Or is it a, a, um, a framework that allows for liberation or even can help but drive toward liberation? And I mean, during the Black Lives Matter movement, I don't know how many of you were politically aware and active during that on social media, the race conscious people, the people who would always be like saying, oh, if you argue with Marx, you're a racist, you can't do that. So many of them later on turned out to be ups, you know? Turned out to be like pretending to be to be a black graduate student someplace, and turned and in the end it was like um, a white right wing kid who had learned the trade on fortune, um, and just went there and guided liberals by saying, you know, no, I'm not going to give money to a settler colonialist who's sitting there on the street corner begging, you know, let him die, because you know what what do I owe to a white person and stuff. So that's like edgy race conscious stuff of the sort that will make sure that you'll definitely never have a multiracial working class movement that can actually affect change. Oh. That is the spirit of liberal identitarianism. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, you haven't um, had a chance to ask, so. Well, we talked about how Marx kind of uh, he liked the way the state governments in, in the United States, uh, I guess, organized themselves and had express freedoms for people. Is that his ideal form of government, too? At the time, he says this is the best that the liberal ideal of government has to show. And it is, in fact, the perfect state realized. So why is society not perfect? Why did egotism not disappear? Turns out, if it's just the state, if it's just the realm of the ideal abstract that's made perfect, it doesn't really change that much. 
So um, he, if given a choice between a revolution that makes a liberal democracy based on a constitution like that of the US and continuing with the reactionary system uh, like they had in Germany and el elsewhere in Europe, clearly you have to go with the liberal democracy. Um, and that's been the policy of social democratic and, and communist parties throughout. I mean, like including in the 1930s, eventually when they were like popular front to defend democracy against um, fascism, because fascism is not just a temporary thing. We'll be the first ones to get locked up. Um, but that doesn't mean uh, the Social Democratic Party in Germany eventually says, yes, a constitutional republic is our ideal. And then we'll work within that to make socialism happen. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, probably never, but vote for us anyway. <laughs> well, especially, you know, there's like Tucholsky says it's perfect that Green Grocer told me why he joined the Social Democrats. You can be in favor of the revolution and make sure it never happens. So that's like, but but still. Um, is that why he advocates for like, well, he doesn't advocate for it, but he says saying this might come to a violent revolution. That's the only way this kind of thing can be. Well, the Social Democrats say, you know, this will avoid a violent revolution. Right. It's going to be a gradual transition. Um, and we're, we're waiting for that patiently, you know. Um, but the revolution tends to be violent. You know? it's like if it isn't, there is like something odd going on. Either the old ruling class has already completely collapsed. That happens, you know, that it just will be like, okay, fine. Like like when, when the king of when I heard it, and it goes, when the king of Saxony was told in 1919 that he had been disposed, he said, well, do run your own damn state then. Macht auf euren Scheiß online. So he wasn't in the position to put up any fight. That happens. But elsewhere in Germany, same revolution, there was still fighting, especially once there was a, a co two competing declarations, one of the social democrats saying, we're calling um, this a German Republic and the communists saying it's the German Socialist Soviet Republic. And then there was civil war and the social democrats aligned themselves for a constitutional republic with the reactionaries, um, with the German army, with the people who were fresh back from Eastern Europe, um, butchering and plundering and so forth in Ukraine and Bielorussia and Poland to do the same thing to German workers. So that idea that the racial other, the Slavs, the Africans possibly, the German workers, the communists, all one and the same thing, that was pretty much an established fact long before the Nazis made it the basis of that policy. I think we're running out of time now, so let's call it a day. If you have questions that you come up with even after the lecture, you can always post them in the forum. You know?